Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you don't know where that is, it's right before 2 Corinthians. So if you don't have an old school Bible, but you want to use one, just raise your hand and these people will bring you one. You can either borrow that or you can keep it. It's our gift to you. Or you can take your smart device. And if you have the YouVersion app downloaded, it's also called the Bible app. Click that open. And if you've got your location services on, we're going to pop up and all the notes and everything are already on there. If you're watching us live online, or one of our many different experiences. We are so glad that you're here. Maybe you're at our Brown County Correctional Facility. So glad that you guys are there. So glad that you're a part of our family and so glad that you guys are a part of our family. And so would you just give like a clap for everybody today? Just 4th of July. (laughs) Oh man, I'm just so glad. Like Pastor Johnny said, so glad to be home. I don't know if it's just me, uh, but it seems like there's so many things in our lives that, that happen that are totally unexpected. Things that you thought were going to happen, plans that you made. Many are the plans of men, but sometimes the plans of God aren't the same. There's so many things that happen in our lives that are unplanned, completely out of left field. So many things that happen that we didn't plan for, that we didn't anticipate. Lots of things that happen to us sometimes that, that don't make sense. There's so many things that happen while we were gone that just didn't make sense, that we just couldn't understand. Like anytime that you fly with a family, there's always room for error to happen. And so there are so many times that we were running through places trying to catch things and we had one flight that was delayed. And so because that flight was delayed, it kind of dominoed another thing. And so we got stuck in an airport for like nine hours and there's nothing good about being stuck in an airport for nine hours. It's just nothing. There's nothing about it that you just go, yay. But at the same time, you go, this was unplanned. But at the same time, it may have been unplanned for me. But somewhere in that process, it wasn't unplanned for God. And so there's so many things that happen that we didn't anticipate, that we didn't prepare for, that don't make sense. Sometimes there's storms. Sometimes there are challenges that happen in our lives. And sometimes there's things that are placed in our past that are just a test to see how we react. And so because of that, sometimes we have really good days. You ever feel like like if you have good circumstances, you have good days, but then we also have times in our lives that are some not so good days. But what's amazing is how much can change within your life within a 24 hour period. It's amazing how much your life can shift, how much your, your life can move, how much your circumstances can adjust just in one day. And within that day, maybe you've experienced this, you can have this huge range of emotions, this huge range of feelings. And I think it's those swings in our emotions, those swings in our feelings that help make this series make sense for me. Faith, hope, love. We find those words in that order in the 13th verse of the 13th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And the book of 1 Corinthians really, so like sometimes we look at these things like they're uh, books and we call them books of the Bible, but sometimes that can be misleading because when you think about a book, like, like uh, Aubrey and I both read an entire book on the time that we were gone. Not the same book. She read one book. I read a, a different book. I think she read like five feet apart and I don't want to read that because I'm old and a man and I don't want to cry when I read stuff. And so I read a different book. I read a book called Hope Quotient. What is the the quotient of the hope in your life. And then we told Isaiah that we both read an entire book and he looked at us and went, nerd. And we're like, I guess when you're a 16 year old boy that you're a nerd. And and so like we look at these and we call them books of the Bible. But what's interesting is at least when you look at the parts that this guy named Paul wrote, they're really just letters, letters that he wrote to his friends. And so this guy, Paul, he had this group of kind of new friends that were in this city called Corinth. And he says, there's a couple of things that are really important. And and he says, and now these three things are going to remain. And it's that one little word that's so important that I want us to really kind of focus on for the next few weeks. Now, these three things are going to remain. They're going to endure. That means there's going to last. That He's saying that there's something that will last. There's something in your life that will continue, that will endure the test of time. And what that is, is faith, hope, and love. And he says the greatest of these 
is love. And so we're going to spend a couple of weeks talking about this trio, faith, hope, and love. And we're going to start today by talking about faith. Cool? Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for my friends who are in here. And God, what every person in here represents. God, like every person in here, represents a whole life that's happening circumstances and scenarios, sometimes storms, sometimes challenges, lots of times great victories. God, sometimes we skim over those victories because we're thinking about the storm before or anticipating the storm to come. So God, today I pray for just a few minutes that you'd help us to pause and to celebrate the moments of victory. Sometimes they're short, sometimes they're really significant. So God, whatever season we're in in this time, let us realize that through faith, anything is possible in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you have a month to like think about like illustrations and a month to think about stories, like I had like all these different stories going through my mind and I thought like what I want to talk about and what I want to share and like can I make them cry? Can I make them laugh? Can I be, oh, can I be? so I was thinking about a mistaken identity. Have you ever had a case of uh, a mistaken identity. Uh, like I had that a couple of weeks ago and I haven't even told Sonny or my kids about this because it, it's a little bit embarrassing, but th let me just lead with this. This fact that I love grocery shopping. Love it. Love it. Love it's like my happy place. The grocery store, I turn into Buddy the Elf. I don't know if it's the anticipation. I don't know what it is. It's like, it's like Christmas for everybody. And especially when they have the 10 for 10. And you're like, oh, oh my gosh, what am I going to get today? 10 things. 10 things of Jello. Are you kidding me? How have I ever lived my life without 10 packages of Jello? And then if there were a nuclear thing, then I'm pretty sure that Jello will still survive. So I love grocery shopping. Pastor Sunny, she doesn't really love grocery shopping. And she really hates when I go grocery shopping. She <laughs> hates when I go grocery shopping because one, one of two things is going to happen. Number one, I'm going to go to the store and buy a bunch of sugar. Or, or number two, I'm going to buy a bunch of stuff we already have. It's like, okay, it's like if you ever need ketchup, I'm your guy. Because at our house, we have it in spades. Are you that person? You walk through the grocery store and you go, huh. I wonder if we have ketchup at home. Well, that's 10 for 10. I mean, I mean as well, who, who doesn't need 10 things of ketchup? And so that's one of two things. It's either sugar or stuff that we already have. And uh, uh, so I love, love, love grocery shopping. And so the other day, a few weeks ago, I was at the festival and, and I was feeling good about myself. And I was feeling good about myself because I was in the grocery store and I was wearing black and it looked like I shouldn't be banned from it. And so uh, I had a little bounce in my step. I, I was rolling through the cereal aisle because everybody knows that the Holy Ghost lives inside of the cereal aisle. How can he not? It's like dessert without the calories. And so as I turned the corner into the cereal aisle, I saw somebody who I actually thought that I knew them. And I was like, I was all in. I was fully committed. You know what I'm talking about? You know, sometimes, sometimes you're like, mm, let me wait and see. Not me. Y'all, I was fully committed. I was in the grocery store. I was in the cereal aisle. I was in a good mood. And so I was all in. Fully extended arm. <laughs> Big wave, smile, hey, ha, ha, hey, ha. Oh, and then they looked up, and I realized that ain't her. It was the wrong, it was the wrong person. But I was, I was, I was fully committed already, and it's hard to go back from that. And so I thought she either thought I was a serial killer. You get it? This is in the cereal aisle. <laughs> now I'm a serial killer. And so she said, I, I said, hey, hi. <laughs> and I realized that it wasn't her. And when a, when a grown man is like, hey, excited to see somebody. Just, anyway, I just said, I, I think I need pickles. And so I just went, <laughs> it was a case of mistaken identity. And I didn't know that person. And I really didn't want to get to know him that way. I didn't want that to be our first. Unless, the, can you imagine if that were you all the time? Every time you saw, hi, hey, hi, hey, it's so good to see you. And they're like, do we know each other? Not yet. <laughs> I think this scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, is a little bit like that. It can sometimes have a case of mistaken identity. Because like if you've been in church for a minute, you, you probably think you know. 1 Corinthians 13. And when somebody says 1 Corinthians 13, you go, oh yeah, that's the love chapter right there. It's the go-to scripture for any wedding or for any Valentine's Day message. Like if you've ever heard a marriage conference or read a marriage book and it was a Christian book, then, then it's been based 
on this verse. It is the Luther. It's the John Legend, the Michael Buble. It is the Ed Sheeran of scriptures. But, but it is not just the love chapter. More than the love chapter, it's actually the life chapter. And so just in this message uh, of this series, I thought, let's read the whole chapter because it's important for us to understand the context because like this guy, Paul, he's not just talking to these people about their lives and their families. He's also talking to us about our lives and our families. And so he says this, he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. And, and let me pause. I'm going to pause just periodically because here's what's happening. This guy, Paul, he's talking to this group of people who are his new friends. But, but he understands that this is a group of people who really use their words well. Do you know people who use their words well? These people were great talkers. They were great orators. They were wordsmiths. They were renowned philosophers around the world. And so what Paul's trying to say to these people is he's trying to help them to understand that life isn't just about all that. And he's trying to help them to understand how can you get a handle on true living? Because you can really talk a good game, but not really live a good game. And so he continues. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy, and if I can fathom all the mysteries, and if I have all the knowledge, and he says that because these were really, really highly educated people. They were some of the most educated people on the planet, and they were known all over the world for their wisdom. And people would take these trips to come to Corinth so that they could have these people listen to them and share their wisdom. So it says, if I have faith that can move mountains, because in spite of the fact that they are really, really intelligent, they are kind of a rare breed. Because typically in life, there's one of two people. There's really smart people or there's really spiritual people. Does that make sense? Like, like really spiritual people can be really smart people, but sometimes if somebody prides themselves on their intelligence, sometimes they feel like they've gotten too smart for God. Have you ever met people like that? And these people, they weren't like that. Even though they were renowned as some of the most intelligent people on the planet, they really, really believed in the supernatural. They really, like, deeply believed in miracles. And so this guy, Paul, is saying that you can use all the words, have all the knowledge, you can see all the miracles, signs, and wonders, but if you don't have love you're nothing. It's a pretty bold statement. I mean, say like you can have all of this stuff. Have you ever met somebody who has all the stuff, but they have no love? They, they have no relationship with their family. Their marriage has fallen apart. Their kids don't talk to them. They, they don't have any friends. I, I was reading about a, a billionaire who, who died a few weeks ago. And, and I mean, he was like, he was way up on the Forbes list. I mean, to get on the Forbes list, like there's billionaires who aren't on the Forbes list. Can you imagine being invited to a dinner party and it is like the billionaire club and you come in and you have like 1.2 billion and you think you're balling and you are when you go to Walmart if you have 1.2 billion. But if you go to like the billionaire club and you run into Jeff Bezos and Bezos is like, oh, <laughs> 1.2 billion. I spend that on fuel for my private helicopter. Like you're like, how do you have 1.2 billion and you have nothing? And this is what he's saying. He's like, you can have all the stuff, but if you don't have love, have you ever met a person who's like that? They seem like they have everything, but they really have nothing. He says, if I give all I possess to the poor, to give over my body to the hardships that I may boast and boast they did. These were like a really boisterous, boasting, bragging bunch of people. And they loved to talk about their successes. They loved to talk about their accomplishments. You know, people who don't have a lot of love in their life, they often brag about other things. See, people who have like really deeply rooted relationships, they love to talk about their relationships. When people have like really great marriages, they don't like to talk about work. They like to talk about their wife or they like to talk about their husband or if people have really great kids. They lo I love people who brag about their kids, by the way. I love people who come up to me and they talk about how dope their kids are and how great their kids are. And here's the thing, your kid doesn't have to be the greatest at anything for you to brag about them. See, people who have really healthy relationships, they talk about those relationships, they live inside of those relationships, but people who don't have those things, they have to find something else to try to distract you 
from their failures. And so these are people who love to talk, to talk about their successes, love to talk about their accomplishments. And so he reminds them again, same chapter, if I don't have any love, I've gained nothing. Then he goes on and he talks about love because, because they had it going on in a lot of areas. They, they'd excelled in life, they'd, they hadn't excelled in love. They'd excelled in business and in knowledge. They had lots of accomplishments but they, which they easily, eagerly let everybody know about. And so Paul points out how they've been hanging their lives on some hooks that weren't meant to and aren't able to hold them. And so he tells them, love is patient, it's kind, it doesn't envy or boast, and it's not rude. It doesn't dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, it doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth that always protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres, it never fails. He says where there's prophecies, those are going to stop. Like where there's tongues, those are going to be stilled. Where there's knowledge, that knowledge will pass away. Because like we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness, completeness comes, what in part is going to disappear? He says, when I was a child, and this is super important, because he, he's not changing the subject. He's adding on to what he's talking about. He says, like, when I was a child, I talked like a child. You know why? Because kids brag, don't they? Kids brag about crazy stuff too. They, they brag about stuff they didn't do, first of all. Kids will lie and then hang their life on that lie. You know, I'm, so, I'm so fast. Have you ever seen a kid and they get new shoes? They're their running shoes. My mom used to call, used to call them runners. He used to get some new shoes. He used to say, these are my running shoes. Do you run? Oh, you ain't never seen nobody run. These shoes? You should see how fast I am in these shoes. And then the kid will never run because they know that they're not fast, especially if those shoes are white. You give a kid some white runners, that kid will brag about, anyway. So when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put those childish things away. What he's saying is, you think what you're leaning into is so established. You think the things that you're leaning into are so mature, but they're not. They're flickering. They're fleeting. But there's something that you can lean into that's going to outlast all this stuff that you've worked so hard for so long to obtain. And he says, right now, we only see a reflection like in a mirror, which is a super interesting analogy because the Corinthians were actually the people that invented the mirror. The Corinthians were the very first people to ever understand the process of polishing metal or polishing stone. And because of that discovery, they become really, really vain people. And they loved to look at themselves and they, they loved to gaze at themselves. And when they discovered that they could gaze at themselves, they, they suddenly began to rank themselves. They suddenly began to compare themselves. Can you imagine life without mirrors, hallelujah, in Jesus' name. You, you, would never, you would never be a shirt puller. I'm a shirt puller. Anybody know what a shirt puller is that you think, it's not working, by the way. It's still there. And there's people who have little tweaks and little twerks, and sometimes I'll pull my shirt 30 times inside of an hour. But here's what I did. Here's what I did to fix that problem. I went to Walmart. I bought me a small mirror. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I've seen that mirror about $3.99. And it's about this big. And it's tall. And when you look in it, you go, dang. <laughs> Makes me want to do the girl picture pose. You know what I'm saying? That's the international girl picture. <laughs> if a girl gets her picture taken not like this, you're like, hey, hey, hey. You better not post that. <laughs> Girls, I don't know what it is. Dudes are like this. Girls. That's me in that little, I got this little mirror, it cost $5. I like, go, oh, snap, I'm looking good. Can you imagine life without mirrors? He says, like, right now, you think that you're seeing the genuine you, but you're not. You're seeing a distorted you. It's close, it's just not concise. But there is going to come a day that we're going to be face to face. Right now we know in part, but, but then we're going to know fully, even as I am fully known. And he says these words that we're basing the whole series on. He says, after we've eliminated all the stuff that we've been hanging our lives on, only three things are going to remain. Faith, 
hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. I love how the Message Bible writes these verses. It says, we don't see things clearly yet. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long until the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. We'll see it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do that will lead us towards that consummation and completeness. We should trust steadily in God. We should hope unswervingly. And we should love extravagantly. When is the last time you loved extravagantly? Because the best of these three is love. And this incredibly intelligent, educated, accomplished guy named Paul writes this beautiful letter to these incredibly intelligent, educated, accomplished people who are so busy and boastful, whose lives are growing and advancing. And he says to them, be careful what you lean into. Be careful what you're looking to. You can put a thousand hooks on the wall and try to hang your life on them. You could do hooks of career or education, hooks of finances or family, accomplishments or appearance. You can hang all these things you want, but be careful which ones you hang your life on. Because in the end, there are only three things that can handle the weight of your life. Faith in God, hope in God, and the love of God. Everything else is going to fail. Everything else is going to fall off the wall, when the weight of life seems overwhelming, when you're trying to get a handle on your schedule and your family, on your marriage, your finances, on the pressure and the stress, there are some handles that just won't break that are going to endure. Have you ever had the handles rip on your bag? I mean, you're coming from the grocery store and the, the rant, it never seems to be the bag with the cereal that rips. It's always the bag with the eggs, or it's always the bag with the glass that rips and falls and shatters. And when those handles rip, Everything else that's in the bag is impacted and infected by the shards of eggs or the shards of glass. How often is life like that? Sometimes you just wish that you could find a handle on your marriage or your kids, a handle on your pain or your depression, a handle on your past, your present, or your future. Sometimes life feels so heavy, so disorganized, so overloaded that there's nowhere you can grab. There's nowhere... You can grip. So this guy, Paul, the apostle, the saint, he comes along and he says, there are some handles that are not going to rip. Put your grip on faith. Put your grip on hope and love. And that's the heartbeat of this series. How to get a handle on this crazy, fluid, constantly shifting, changing, evolving life. And so today, I want to talk about the first handle, faith. And it is a big word. It's a monumental word. And I love that Pastor Dallas talked about this last week. And I thought he had this really great line when he talked about getting pushed in the pool, which every dude loves pushing people in the pool. And he said, we've become comfortable living on the edge of our faith where things are basic and containable but afraid to go beyond in our faith where things are impossible and unthinkable. And some of you think a good marriage is impossible and unthinkable. You think success at your job is, it, is impossible and unthinkable. But the question is, where do I change that perspective? How do I start? And it's so vast. It's so massive. What does faith even mean? Like what is faith? Why is it so important? Because everywhere you look in this book, it talks about faith. Almost every book in this book has a detailed study on faith. Every person that it talks about, every person that God used stepped out in it. It was, it was never easy. It was never simple. There are over 250 stories in the Bible that chronicle great acts of faith, which makes us wonder, where do we even get? We're like, how do we start? Well, there's a book in here. It's called Hebrews. And in the 11th chapter, there is something called the faith Hall of Fame. I love that. Like these are heroes, people whose lives were so filled with faith that they became heroic. And it talks about how they handled life with faith. And I think one of the most important verses for us to understand is in that chapter, and Pastor Dallas highlighted it last week, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God, which makes it just seem even bigger. You read a verse like that, it, it makes us feel so much more pressure because, because we, we can't please God in doubt or disbelief. Can't. We have to have faith. So luckily, the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews gives us the definition. It says this. 
It says, now faith, and I love that it starts with that word, now, because if your faith is real, it is active. It is right now. It's not next month. It's not next year. It is right now. You need faith for your family right now. You need faith for your finances right now. You need faith for your kids or your career right now. Anyway, now, now faith, watch this, is confidence in what we hope for and an assurance about what we don't see, which pretty much sums it up and makes it sound super easy. It is confidence in what we hope for, and it is assurance about what we see, which is the biggest pushback I get from people. I just don't see it. Like, am I supposed to have confidence in something I don't see? And everybody knows that seeing is believing. Like, I have to see it before I can believe it. And I can understand where you're coming from. So let me just give you super fast three things that faith is. And let me start with the first argument, that primary pushback that I get from people, and say that faith is believing even when I don't see it. We do this every day. You have faith every day. Like, have you ever seen Wi-Fi? You've never seen Wi-Fi, but you believe in it every time you send a text, every time you send an email or a message on social media, and you have taken some of the most important words of your life and trusted them to this thing that you cannot see. How about the wind? I mean, you, you see the effects of the wind every day, but you've never in your life seen the actual wind. What I'm saying is that life is not seeing is believing. It's actually believing is seeing. It's choosing to believe in something, whether I can see it or comprehend it or have ever experienced yet or not. When I've lost my grip, when the handles seem to snap and the contents of my life shatter and scatter, I have to choose to believe that God is going to do what he says he's going to do, even when, especially when I can't see it. The other day I was on a flight and I, like, I normally fade out during the pre-flight instructions because I've like heard them a hundred times, but I'd forgotten my headphones in my bag and the bag was over top and I wasn't allowed to get up. And so I was forced to listen to what the flight attendant was saying. And so she started through her routine and she said, in case of an emergency. And I thought, whoa, wait a minute. Does that mean there's actually been an emergency on this plane? Maybe I better pay attention. Obviously they've discovered some things that in an emergency I may need to know. So she said, in case of an emergency, oxygen masks will come down. Take that mask, tug it towards you, and although you can't see the oxygen, it is flowing. It is now safe for you to breathe. And I thought, are you kidding me? You want me to put my life in the hands of something I can't see? You want me to trust my whole family, my whole future in something that I can't see? But you know what I didn't do? I didn't get off the plane. I flew on, I flew on because I knew that somebody had made a plan for an emergency, whether I could see that thing or not, I could trust in that thing. Here's the second thing is faith is obeying even when I don't understand it. Ever heard of a guy named Noah? He's in the book, he's actually in the Hall of Fame. He made it, he was a first ballot Hall of Famer and he's in there because he did something even though he didn't understand it. He built a boat on dry land. Here's how his homies responded. I said, no, what are you doing? Said, I'm building a boat. What's the boat? What's the thing that's going to float when it rains? What's rain? I don't know. There's something that's going to happen, and when it happens, it's going to cause a flood. Well, what's a flood? Man, I don't know, but get on the boat or you're going to find out. Like, it's just, that's faith. Faith is building a boat on dry land when there hasn't been a flood, and it's never rained. It's obeying even when you don't or other people don't understand. Don't be surprised when other people don't understand your obedience. Disobedient people will never understand your obedience. Why are you going to a life group? Better yet, why are you leading a life group? Your life's not together. Or why are you going through journey to wholeness? Those people aren't doctors. Why are you trusting them? Why are you giving your money to that? Or why are you volunteering your time to that? Don't let someone else's disobedience or ignorance stop you from doing what you're supposed to do. Just believe, even when you don't understand. And here's the third thing, faith is trusting even when I don't get what I want. Y'all, that's the tough one. That is the hard one. Even if I don't get what I expected, even if I don't get what I'm hoping for or praying for, even when there's some pain, even when there are some problems, even when I have to endure some things that I don't want to endure, I have got to trust that God has a better way that he will help me in my pain, that he will help me in my loss, that he will help me even when things don't make sense. And it's, 
It's really the culmination of Hebrews 11. Like it lists all these important people, all these faithful people, Abraham and Isaac, Noah and Moses, Gideon and David. And it tells us how they went through all these difficult times, but it didn't affect their faith. And at the end of the Hall of Fame, the writer gives us this beautiful reminder. He says, because of their faith, the world was not worthy of them. They're all commended for their faith, but none of them received what they had been promised because God had planned something better for them and for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Things didn't turn out how they thought they would, but even though they didn't see it at the time, they turned out better. Their lives were the completion of my favorite verse on faith. When I'm, when I'm dealing with doubt, when I'm, when I'm dealing with disbelief, when I'm negative, when I'm struggling and I feel like, like I'm losing everything, like when the handles of my life snap and the contents shatter and scatter, I hang my life on this hook. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And what I wonder today is that you, are you one of those who love him? Sometimes the struggles in your life are allowed so that you'll be funneled towards the only person who can solve them. God doesn't cause our problems or our pain, but he will certainly use our problems and our pain to funnel us to the only solution. Everything works for the good of those who love him. Are you one who loves him today? If you're not, you can be before you leave here. All you have to do is hang your life on the hook of faith. Would you close your eyes all across this place? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. What are you hoping for today? Everything that you're hoping for can be solved by hanging your life on the hook of faith. So this morning, what we call that is salvation. We're gonna give you opportunity to hang your life on that hook. Here's how, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask for people to do two things. First is with nobody looking around, I'm gonna ask for people in just a moment who want to hang their life on the hook of faith to raise their hand and make eye contact with me. Once you've made eye contact with me, you can put your hand down and then I'm gonna ask everybody in here to repeat the same prayer after me. We're not gonna center people out or embarrass people, but if you're here, you say, Sean, I'm not a Jesus guy or a Jesus girl, but I'd like to be before I leave this place today. I wanna hang my life on the hook of faith and receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. With nobody looking around, would you raise your hand and make eye contact with me right now? Thanks, 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 thanks. Thank you, thank you, thanks, thanks, thanks. I'm gonna ask everybody in here, say these words after me. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Please forgive me, change me. Come into my life, make me different. I hang my life on you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, would you do us a favor? Take the hello card that's in the seat back in front of you. Just fill out the bottom part. Check the box that's highlighted with yellow. It says, I'm choosing to follow Jesus. Tear it off. Either put it in the black bucket so when it comes around at the end or take it out to the Welcome Center. We just want the chance to pray for you, to follow up with you. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes one more time. Don't leave yet. We're not finished. Pastor Sunday's going to close this out. But I wonder if you're here. You say, I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl. But maybe you're in the middle of that, like your handles have snapped. The handles have snapped in your marriage or with your kids or at your job or with your health. Whatever it may be, you know that you've got some handles that have snapped. And you say, I need to pray for balance. If that's you. Would you raise your hand so that I could pray for you today? Man, God, for so many people, God, we love you and we thank you. Thank you that you will supply all our needs according to your riches and your glory in Christ Jesus. And so today for my friends who are in this place, who the handles have snapped, God, I pray for stability. I pray for balance in Jesus' name. Amen.